Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the 13th session on our course on ADR and arbitration this session will be on conduct of arbitral proceedings we will be discussing provisions from section 19 to section 27 this is uh, the set of provisions which deal with the way the arbitration has to be conducted. But before I start with these provisions, let me quickly tell you what all have we discussed in arbitration so far. We understood the basic principles, understood the substantive provisions like arbitration agreement, then what is the composition? How can you challenge an arbitrator? What is the importance of fifth schedule, seventh schedule in the act? Then we discussed about competence of an arbitral tribunal to rule on its competence, power of arbitral tribunal to pass interim measures. I also introduced the concept of emergency awards and how the Supreme Court accepts India seated emergency awards to be enforceable under section 17. We discussed about section 9, we compared section 9 with section 17, we said now after the amendment of 2015, we do not have any significant difference between section 9 and section 17 except, except of course the time when you can invoke these two provisions. Now apart from these, section 18 has been discussed once in, 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 in initial lectures where I said that 18 is Magna Carta of this Act. 18 puts an obligation on the tribunal to treat parties equally. So the tribunal cannot be favoring one party against the other parties. This is a principle which you find in section 18. So with this now we start uh, our discussion on conduct of arbitral proceedings. And as I said, I will be talking about good number of sections from section 19 to section 27. I may skip some of the provisions which may not be very relevant and the manner in which we will be dealing with these provisions is I will tell you the provision then I will give you the explanation. So we will be referring to the slide in which you I will reproduce the provision and then I will be explaining these provisions. So starting with section 19, section 19 deals with determination of rules of procedure. 19 is about procedural autonomy. The first subsection says that arbitral tribunal is not bound by CPC or Evidence Act, the technicalities of CPC and Evidence Act. So the procedure is not going to be a very technical procedure as it happens with courts. Subsection 2 says that the parties have the freedom to agree on the procedure according to which they want to conduct their arbitration. But this freedom is subject to this part. You can see the freedom is subject to this part. Subsection 2 says subject to this part, the parties are free to agree on the procedure to be followed by the arbitral tribunal in conducting the arbitration. This is one provision which attracts parties towards arbitration because it gives tremendous freedom to the parties to choose whatever procedure they want to adopt for their arbitration. Then there is a default provision. If parties do not choose the procedure which they want to adopt for their arbitration, the procedural law, then in that case the tribunal will have to conduct proceeding in the manner in which it considers appropriate. So this is a default provision. Party freedom, then default provision. Parties have the freedom to choose the procedural law in the absence of which tribunal under subsection 3 will choose the procedural law. In both these cases, whatever choices is made, whether by the parties or, the, by the, or by the tribunal, 
the choice made is subject to this part. Subject to this part obviously means subject to other provisions of part 1. We will be talking more about it later on. So, therefore, subsection 4 says the power of the arbitral tribunal under subsection 3. As I said, if parties do not identify the procedural law for their arbitration, then tribunal will identify. And the power of tribunal under subsection 3 includes power to determine admissibility, relevance, materiality and weight of the evidence. So, the crux of section 19 is it gives you a two level system, it provides procedural autonomy, it gives freedom to the parties to choose procedural law for their arbitration and this such provisions at international level are very useful because as I said such procedural autonomy encourages parties to adopt arbitration as a mode of dispute resolution because that is a huge freedom which has been given to the parties by way of section 19. What is the extent of freedom? Parties can make their own set of rules or parties can adopt rules of some institutions. You and me can write that in case of any dispute we will refer to arbitration to be done according to the rules of International Chamber of Commerce. So, parties can devise their own set of rules, parties can designate rules of some institution. This designation can be found in the arbitration agreement, this designation can be found in submission agreement. We have discussed these two terms in section 7 if you recall. That is the extent of freedom which parties have and therefore section 19 attracts disputants towards arbitration. But I said that the freedom given to parties, the freedom given to the tribunal in subsection 3, the freedom is subject to other provisions. I will tell you some of the provisions which are important which must be kept in mind while deciding which law shall govern your arbitration, which procedural law shall govern your arbitration. So, when you decide which procedural law shall govern your arbitration, you have to keep in mind that section 18 cannot be violated. I just mentioned section 18 is the Magna Carta of this act. Section 18 is the equality provision of this act. Tribunal has to remain equal with both the parties. You cannot have a procedure which allows tribunal to be biased. Whatever procedure you adopt must be subject to section 23 subsection 1. We will discuss 23 subsection 1 which says that there has to be a statement of claim, there has to be a statement of defense before the tribunal. You cannot have a procedure which says that there will only be a statement of claim and there won't be any statement of defense. Whatever procedure you adopt is subject to sub section 24, subsection 2, subsection 3. We will talk about section 24 also. 24 talks about hearing which has to be given by the tribunal, it talks about written proceedings. Whatever procedure you adopt, you must definitely incorporate something like section 27. Section 27 talks about court assistance in taking evidence because we will discuss that arbitral tribunal is a private forum, does not have the power of compulsion. It cannot ensure attendance of witnesses. So, therefore, in order to ensure that witnesses attend the proceedings, the tribunal may require assistance of court and therefore, your procedure must also have such a mechanism. It is subject to section 27. Section 30 which talks about settlement, we will discuss that tribunal is obliged to encourage parties to go for more amicable methods of dispute resolution like conciliation, mediation, etc. So, whatever procedure you adopt for your arbitration that must also have something similar to Section 30, Section 31 talks about form and content of arbitral award. The form and content as mentioned in Section 31, subsections 1, 3, 4 are binding. You have to follow it. Whatever procedure you adopt, it must definitely contain the requirements of Section 31. 32 tells me how the proceedings will terminate. Those methods of termination of proceeding of arbitration must be incorporated, must be there as part of your proceeding. Section 33 provides for a mechanism to make corrections in the award, a mechanism to pass additional award. Such mechanism should be there. 
So, whatever procedure you adopt for your arbitration is subject to these provisions at least. You must definitely incorporate these provisions. In addition to these, the procedure must be consistent with public policy of India. Maybe in next or next to next lecture we will talk more about public policy of India. But what I can say right now is whatever procedural law you adopt for your arbitration must be consistent with the public policy of India. And same set of conditions will apply whether parties are choosing the procedural law or the tribunal is choosing under the default clause subsection 3 of section 19. So, same set of conditions will apply whether parties are choosing the procedural law or the tribunal is choosing the procedural law. But we have to keep in mind when the tribunal is choosing the procedural law, it must ensure that both the parties are familiar with the adopted procedure. See, when parties themselves agree and designate some procedural law, they are doing it out of their volition, they are aware about that procedure, but when the tribunal is doing it, tribunal must do it keeping in view that both the parties are aware about the procedure. The procedure must be acceptable to both the parties. Why do we have a default mechanism is also interesting to understand. We could have given this freedom to the parties that you are, you are free to choose the procedural law according to which you want to conduct your arbitration. It is possible that one party may adopt dilatory tactics and may never agree to the proposal given by the other party. And if he is never agreeing to the proposal given by the other party, he may be in a position to defeat the purpose of this act. The whole process of arbitration may be sabotaged. So, therefore, in order to counter that situation, law incorporates a default mechanism that if there is no agreement between the parties, then tribunal will come into picture under section 19 subsection 3 and will make the appointment. There are many choices which parties can make. There are many choices which the tribunal can make. A tribunal can choose adversarial procedure. I discussed it in the initial lectures. Adversarial procedure is the procedure which is followed in courts where parties are adversaries. Tribunal may adopt or parties may adopt inquisitorial procedure. Parties may or tribunal may adopt some ad hoc procedure depending on the nature of the dispute or institutional procedures may be adopted. So, you are free to devise your own procedure, you are free to adopt the procedure of the institutions. So, the first provision is section 19 which gives freedom to the parties to choose procedural law, the law according to which they want to conduct their arbitration. As I said, it is a two level provision. First level is parties have the freedom. Second level is in case parties do not exercise their freedom, then it will be done by the tribunal. The only thing which we have to keep in mind is this freedom is subject to other provisions of this part, other provisions of part 1, particularly to the provisions which I mentioned. 23, 24, 27, 30, 31, 32, 33, these are the provisions which are particularly important and most importantly whatever procedure you decide for yourself that must be consistent with the public policy of India. Coming to the next provision section 20 which is about place of arbitration. Again you have the party autonomy here, freedom of parties. Parties are free to agree on the place of arbitration. Parties are free to agree on the place of arbitration. And then you have a default provision. Failing any agreement, if parties do not decide a place of arbitration, then place of arbitration shall be determined by the arbitral tribunal. So, this is the default mechanism. But when arbitral tribunal is deciding place of arbitration, it must keep in mind the circumstances of the case. And most importantly, the tribunal while deciding the place of arbitration must keep in mind the convenience of the parties. The places where parties reside, the convenience of the parties must be kept in mind while deciding the place of arbitration. Circumstances are important for the tribunal. So, this is again subject to party autonomy. Parties are free to decide the place of arbitration. If parties do not decide the place of arbitration, then in that case it shall be done by the tribunal keeping in mind 
the circumstances of the case and convenience of the parties. In addition to these two points, there is one more aspect, an important aspect.